Good morning. So a, uh, a city is not defined by one sports team. Um, there were two games that were held on Sunday. Um, I chose to go to the Penguin game where the Pittsburgh team beat the Boston team and scored five times more goals. <clears throat> I, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, and I wish the best to, uh, he, Colin's gone, I do wish the best to the Patriots and that they're going for, I believe, their fifth Super Bowl. Perfect. So today, we're going to talk about uh, big data for the big box stores. Um, we are a manufacturer of home bedding products. We make pillows, pillow covers, mattress covers, mattress pads, things like that. Everything we make is basically white. It's the, it's the thing that go underneath the comforter or the, or the bedspread. Um, most of our products are allergen barrier and we sell to the big box stores. And uh, just as a, as a show of hands, is anybody here a manufacturer that sell to retail? Hmm. Hmm. You are missing a lot of fun. <laughs> so today, we're gonna talk about uh, three pieces of big data that we use. The first is EDI and our order fulfillment process. The second, is category management, and that's something I don't know if you've ever heard before, but we'll talk through that. And the third is POS data. Uh, so, um, EDI, does anybody here use EDI in their business? One, two, three, three. Okay, let's explain, let's explain EDI. EDI is like texting. So here is a, uh, a screen where I'm going to be talking to my daughter, and I say, can you pick up some milk for me while you're out? And she says, K, because that's how kids talk. <laughs> and then she tells me I got a gallon of skim milk, and I say, uh, OK. And then she says it was $3.75, and I tell her I put money in your account. Typical texting scenario happens a lot. In business, we will get an EDI record called an 850, which is a, uh, a sales order. And they'll tell us, we want to buy 5,000 of something that you sell. Here, we'll say pillows. And ship it by 211. We will send them back a EDI 997, or acknowledgement, basically K. And then we will send them an 856, which is an advanced ship notification that basically says, we sent these cartons to you on this date at this time, and here's what's in them. They acknowledge that back. We send them an invoice electronically with an EDI 810 record. And they say, OK. <laughs> and, um, that is the, basically the transaction of ordering, fulfilling, invoicing for a manufacturing company. It happens thousands and thousands of times a day. We get orders all through the course of the day, and um, it is very, very voluminous. So uh, just very quickly, EDI sales, advanced ship, acknowledgments, hundreds to thousands of records a day, 365 days a year. Some other records, we have an ERP system, we have a WMS system. The two systems send EDI back and forth to each other all day long. I got a, rec I got a PO, here it is. I, got, I received it in, here's the inventory. It goes back and forth. There are shipping requests, everything that we ship, every time we scan a package, it, cre it creates a record, an EDI record, and an acknowledgement. And anytime there's an inventory adjustment, we will have cycle counts, physical inventories, picks, replenishments, everything that you would possibly do in a warehouse, they all generate EDI records. When we go to ship something, there are three documents. The first document 
is called a GS1 label. A GS1 label is a shipping label that basically says, here's what I'm going to ship from us to you. I'm going to ship on FedEx. I'm going to ship on UPS. You're going to send a truck to me. I'm going to send a truck to you, whatever it is. There is also a carton label. That's an internal document that we keep on our carton that says what's in that carton, all barcoded. And there's a packing slip inside the pack. The packing slip goes inside the box that said, here's what's in this box. Okay, you guys have all ordered things online. You've seen all these labels before. Here's the thing. When you do retail fulfillment, the data on all of those documents has to be consistent and complementary. You have to have the same ASN, same ASN number, the same content number, the same uh, inventory levels. You have to have the, when we send the ASN, the ASN has to go in a certain period of time or there are penalties. We'll go over those in a minute. And then something happened about, oh, maybe five years ago. Um, all the, the big box stores, the retailers, whenever you ordered online through their dot-com company, um, they used to use the inventory that we would send them. They would warehouse. They would ship it to every customer that ordered. And then about five years ago, they changed, and they said, why should we do that? Why don't we send... Why don't we send an electronic record to American Textile, and when someone orders a pillow, you send them the pillow. We don't want to send them the pillow anymore. So we have to hold the inventory, and for doing that, they will give us a, an additional, and we'll make up a number here and say 50 cents. We'll give you an extra 50 cents an order. However, to get the data to us, they send us an EDI record. In some cases, Walmart does. In other cases, they go through a third-party broker. Commerce Hub is one. Channel Advisors, Jet.com, Amazon. There's a lot of different companies that will be this middleman that will send their transactions back and forth. We have to make our GS1 label look like it came from that company. We can't let them know that we fulfilled. We let them think they fulfilled, which is, which is a great idea for them. The, um, the packing slip comes from them. They send it to us. The packing slip is printed on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. The GS1 label is on label stock. Comes out of two different systems, two different times, in two different orders, on two different printers. Now, you know, everybody here know what Cyber Monday is? You know how many Thousands and thousands of orders we get on Cyber Monday. Now, imagine you get a stack of GS1 labels and a stack of packing slips, and they're all in different, form, different orders. So manually, someone has to go through, pull up a GS1 label, and then look down through and see if they can find the packing slip and put them together and say, ship this. Okay. It is a huge undertaking. Uh, we have solved that. We actually print the packing slip on label stock, and we have it matched so that we print a GS1 label and a packing slip and a GS1 label and a packing slip. They're, right, they're interleaved with each other, so we just tear two off, and it, it, was a, it was a great solution. It saved, I can't even tell you how many man hours it saves, especially on Cyber Monday. Another thing that's interesting is for, for us manufacturers that have ERP systems, you have normally uh, 90 to 100 if you sell to retail customers. So you have maybe a couple hundred ship to addresses. We just spent 92 years shipping thousands of boxes to one address in one order. Now we get tens of thousands of orders to ship one product to an infinite number of customers. So our data, our big data just got bigger. We now have a and an address book that is growing every single day. Let's talk about cost. EDI charges. 
Uh, for those of you that um, have EDI, you usually get your data in through a VAN, a value-added network. The, the retailer will send their EDI to them, they send it to us, and they charge us a fee. You can look to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to get EDI transactions into your company. And you can spend uh, three to five thousand dollars a month on just um, administrative services, programming services, uh, things like that. That'll that'll so that your van can help you with with uh, errors and problems. There are shipping charges. The retailer pays the shipping charge to get the data to get their products to their location. As long as we do everything right, if we do things wrong they charge us the shipping. And you can have a 53-foot container truck is about $5,000 to send anywhere in the country. If it's a large pillow order, we can have 20 container trucks. So if that charge all comes back on us, that's a big bill. Let's talk about chargebacks. This was a very eye-opening thing for me when I went to American Textile, this concept of the chargeback. You send me a sales order for $100,000. I send you the products. You pay me $90,000. I say, well, where's my other $10,000? Well, you had some chargebacks. You did this wrong and this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. And so we're going to fine you $10,000. It's not a bad idea. I understand what they're doing. They have, in our case, we have 50 retailers we ship to. Walmart has 20,000 vendors. They have to enforce their rules or they won't be able to function as a company. I get it. Some examples. Those ASNs, that, uh, that confirmation that says we shipped you something, if it's incomplete or inaccurate, it's $5 a carton. You send them 10,000 cartons, it's a lot of money. If the ASN is not received within two hours of when we ship it, it's another $5. If we have bad data on the shipping label, it's another $5. If we ship, in some vendors, if we ship more than twice from one warehouse to one location, we get a $250 fine and we have to pay for the freight. If we fail to route on time, routing is I call the vendor, I call the, I'm sorry, I call the retailer, I have 10,000 boxes to send you, I'll, they tell us we'll send you a truck, it'll be there on Tuesday between 8 and 10, we schedule it. If we route incorrectly, again, 250 plus freight charges. If we do not manage our big data, if our, if our, Packing slip, ASN, and our carton labels don't match. It could be anywhere from $15 to $100 a carton. Inaccurate cube weights. We know how much all of our product weighs. We tell them how heavy it is, how big it is, the cube size, the weight. They send the proper truck. If we're wrong, they can charge us 10% of the total cost of the bill plus the freight. And my personal favorite. If we have trends in any one of these categories, if we month after month after month get the same charge, they can triple the charge back to us as a, as a repeat offender. Note, every single one of these exceeds our margin for that product. We are well motivated to manage our big data correctly. Let's talk about, does anybody here know the term planogram? You know what a planogram is? Um, I didn't want to necessarily have shameless um, information on our company, so we'll pretend we sell cereal. This is the planogram for a, uh, a cereal outlet. But a planogram is basically when you walk into a store Here's how, it's, here's how the store is set. 
And you'll notice when you go to any store, if you go to a Giant Eagle or a Coons or a Shop and Save, they look kind of the same. That's not an accident. We need to maintain as part of our big data the critical dimensions for every item in the planogram. So we need to know the planogram length, width, height, and weight. We also need to maintain the product length, width, height, and weight, which could be different. You know, if you have a product hanging in a vinyl bag and you put it on a peg hook and it sags a little bit, that half an inch that it sags requires that we keep two sets of data. One is the length on the peg hook, one is the length in the box. We also need to keep the, the, the information for the carton. We need to understand if it's going to be a pallet loaded product or floor loaded. If it's pallet loaded, we got to factor in the cost of a pallet. Do you know what a CHEP pallet is? Anybody know that term? A CHEP pallet is a, it looks like a pallet, but it's painted blue. And instead of two by fours, they use four by fours. They're very heavy and some customers require them. We've got to understand if it's a CHEP pallet or a regular pallet. We need to know the item metrics. We need to know the brand, the description, the SKU number that we have inside our system. The UPC, that's the code that the, co the cashier scans whenever they, when you buy something. And the G10, which is the UPC and our GLN in front of it, which is our, our personal information because you could get the UPC from the, from the, the retailer. They could say use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And every vendor that sells them, that product has that same UPC. We do what's called store shops, which means we go to every store that we service as often as we can. We take pictures. We document how things look. We document the price. We document how many they have in inventory. We document everything, and we put all that into a database. And it is huge. Category management was a very unique term for me when I started at American Textile. A category manager is someone who owns that category for that store. So in the utility betting, we may be the category manager for Walmart. That means that we, the vendor, go into Walmart and tell them, here's how you have your planogram. I thought Walmart had planogram maker uppers. And they would say, here's where we're going to put the pillows up here and the pillow covers here and we're going to put this here and this here. The category manager does. The vendor does. It is an honor to be a category manager. That's the good news. The bad news is we are responsible for maximizing the revenue to the retailer for our category. So if one of our competitors' products are selling better than ours, we have to move them into a more prominent place and we have to move ours down, which was kind of crazy to me. But as long as we are category managers, we will always have product placement in the stores. So that's, that's the advantage. Um, why do you put kids cereal on the bottom? And that's where the kids are. Why do you put perfume and jewelry near the door? What's that? They are, except when they spray them on you when you walk through. Why? Impulse buys. Impulse buys. Men love to go shopping the day of an event. It's Christmas Eve. It's my wife's birthday. So they put the really expensive stuff right inside the door. It's all planogram. It's all knowing how your customers buy things. Here's the cost of big data on the planogram. You have to store and back up millions and millions of records. You have to perform these store shops. There are 4,200 Walmarts, 1,800 Targets, 1,100 Bed Baths, 1,200 Kohl's, 1,500 Big Lots. In total, our products are in over 15,000 stores. We send our employees into those stores 
every day, we do it too. If I go on vacation and we happen to go to a city I've never been in before, I will go into a target and I will look and see what the planogram looks like. And if it doesn't look like it should, I report that back. Again, we are to sacrifice profit to maximize the net income of the retailer. Some solutions, JDA Pro Space, Shelf Logic, and Visual Retailing, I, I don't recommend or not recommend any of them. They're, they're, just, they're just three that I found. Um, I'm not here to recommend software for you. But um, there are a lot of really, really high quality solutions in this space to help you manage this. POS data, it all starts with the cash register. Every time you hit the cash register, we get a record. 15,000 stores, say there's 10 registers in each store. Maybe 10 customers per hour. You buy 10 things at each sale. Stores open 12 hours a day, could generate 66 billion records of POS data a year. We get the date, the time, the SKU, the UPC, the store location, sale price, manufacturer's price, the margin, and we get inventory information. They send us whether their inventory is on the shelf, in the storeroom, um, lost, so we know exactly what, in, what, what they have. And we can get this data either through EDI, which again is probably another $100,000 a year, or we can go out to a vendor portal, which is a web page that the retailers maintain. We go online, um, we can resolve issues, we can pull POS data, but it, it's a lot of labor to do. And as the category manager, we get all of our data and all of our competitors' data because we have to manage where to put things on the planogram. Wouldn't you love to have all the sales data for your competitors? What would that do for your strategy? If you see one of your competitors' products are just flying off the shelf and you can put some strategy together to put a product that's better or you can, you can combat that, wouldn't that be a nice thing to know? Where are the BI people? Okay. Business analytics, that's really the, the key to this whole thing. You're going to hear all about that from Dr. Peel in a little, in a little while, so um, I am certainly not a BI expert. Um, but this is the key. You need a great POS tool. You need to be able to look at trending. So for example, pillows are bought most often in the morning. Bad night's sleep. I'm going to go get a new pillow. Protective bedding is purchased most often in the middle of August. Why? Back to school. Everybody sends their college student back to school with a whole bunch of protective bedding because I don't even want to know what's on those mattresses. <laughs> so we're going to encase it in something. But you can spot these trends. And you can spot a trend that says, I have the inventory level from my retailer. I know how much I'm shipping them. They're either selling a lot more than I'm shipping, which means product is either flying off the shelf or they're just spinning off my inventory. You know, if it's in mid-August and, and they're, they're selling more than they're buying, that's a good thing. If they do it in the middle of March, uh-oh. So you can see what they're selling, you can see what we're shipping, you can look at the difference and you can make determinations. You can see when their inventory is starting to run down and your salespeople can go hit them and say, you know, I see your inventory's down with some 
let's order some more. Let's, let's pick it back up. You're going you're gonna to run yourself short. Here are some reports we've run that show that if you don't do anything or you buy at your current level, you're going to be out of product in two months. And if it's a 90-day lead time item, then you have, a, you have a problem. You can spot these trends with a great POS tool. Uh, POS tools, uh, Velocity from VMT, uh, Shiloh from Bentonville Software. Um, which retailer lives in Bentonville? Walmart. Who is the biggest retailer in the, on the planet? Amazon. Amazon. All EDI driven, all big data driven. You need a great BI tool for your executives. You need to be able to drill down from the customer to the product category to the SKU to the date to the time and you need to be able to spin the cube around. How many did I buy in this time period? How many pillows did I buy? Of the pillows that I bought, what SKUs are selling best? You need to train and support your subject matter experts. There is no way in the world you're going to have enough IT resources to go around to be able to generate all the reports that your, your executives are going to need. People need to be self-service. You need a BI tool that's going to help you. We happen to use Cognos. Uh, there are a lot of BI tools out there. Um, <clears throat> you could use ClickView, and, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of different tools you can use. Uh, again, I, I don't make a recommendation on any one of them, but we use Cognos. And you need to optimize a data warehouse for reporting billions of rows of POS data, millions of rows of planogram data, millions of rows of EDI data. If you don't have an optimized data warehouse, you are going to spend hours and days waiting for reports to come back to you. So, let's take a quick summary. EDI, cost of big data is the delivery charges, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's worth it. 60, another 60 grand or so in support charges. Benefits, you get to do your order processing much more quickly. And it's a requirement of retailers. That's the only way they're going to talk to you. Threats of mismanaging your big data. Big financial penalties, the chargebacks we talked about, could be hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, could be millions of dollars a year, could be enough to make your company into a nonprofit. Poor scorecards. We get a scorecard from all of our customers. 92 years old, we're still getting scorecards. We're still getting report cards. They tell us how well we did on on-time shipments, shipping complete, and were we compliant with everything we need to be compliant on. So if we had ASN errors, if we, had, we, we didn't ship complete, we get marked down. You get marked down enough months in a row and they will no longer be one of your customers. POS data, storage and backup, the charges to get it or the costs. The benefits of big data, access to all of your customers' sales data and margins, access to your competitors' data. I still don't think this is legal, but it, it seems like it's, that's the way it works. It's wonderful. It's great to know. And you know when, where, how, how much everybody's buying, when they're buying, and you can start doing these trend analysis that you need to do. Planogram data. The expensive store shops, the extensive storing the data, the software costs, sacrificed margins. If you don't do your information management well, you will be giving too much to your competitors. Could be up to you. As a category manager, you have great options. You combine analysis of your POS data with your planogram data, and you become a very valuable re uh, um, vendor to your customer. Poor performance equals lost business. 
and you can push too much money to your competitors. Um, are there any where are there any other CIOs here? Okay. Um, <clears throat> when we get together every other month or so with the Pittsburgh CIO group through Plus Consulting, and when we have our uh, premier CIO summit, there's always a session on how can IT be more valuable to the business? How can IT be seen as more than a hardware jockey? How can we be seen as a strategic partner? How can I partner with the business users to help grow the company? If you do all this well, you manage, and this is just managing big data well, you can drive profitable growth, it's driven by IT, and it's enabled by big data. So here's the answer. If you want to know how IT can partner with executives and be, have a seat at the table and have a decision-making role and be partnered with and be included on mergers and acquisitions and all the other things that we in IT wish we could be in, if you can help your company grow profitably, <clears throat> that's when you're a success in that area. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Uh, basically is, um, do, as the CIO, do I hire functional um, analysts to ensure data quality just like on the manufacturing side we ensure product quality? Uh, the, <clears throat> the answer is yes in, in two ways. Uh, the first way is I have a BI team and the BI team is responsible for scrubbing the data, making sure it's right, making sure that we have referential integrity across all of our databases, making sure that if a user runs a report and we run a production report, you get the same number. Uh, getting different numbers is, is a bad thing. Um, the other side is uh, we have a data integrity team uh, and they're responsible for making sure that the data that goes into the system is complete and accurate so in general, in, an IT, in, a, in a manufacturing world, you have an item master, which keeps all of your products, and they have to be right. The critical dimensions in that part have to be exactly right, down to the quarter of an inch. You have a customer master that says, here are all the names and addresses and who I'm going to ship to, and that has to be right. And then you have a routing table, and the routing table says, here is how I am going to route my products to my customers based on their requirements to me that they publish in the form of a vendor guide and update it every year. So any example of, I won't use any names, one of our customers has a routing table that says, if you are sending me 30 cartons or less, send it FedEx. 30 carton, 31 cartons to 5,000 pounds, send it LTL, less than truckload. If it's more than 5,000 pounds, call me and I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell you if I'm going to send a truck or if you should just get a, a full truck and send it. But all those pieces all have to be exactly right or else the chargebacks start flowing in. And there is, it's a very subjective thing. If they give you a chargeback, it's a chargeback. You know, the referee calls holding, it's holding. Whether you are holding or not, it's, uh, sorry to bring up. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's we do. We have uh, we have uh, a couple different quality positions on our team. Or has it always been kind of a commitment for, for a long time now? 
Um, again, that was the, the question was, have we had this commitment to do the big data and the analysis for a long time? Um, in 1999, we purchased our ERP system. It's called Frontier by the company um, Friedman. Um, one of the advantages is when we got it, we got Cognos with it. I don't think we planned to get a BI tool, but it was delivered with the ERP. And we looked at it, and we, when, when I started 10 years ago, uh, we used Cognos, and we had 13 reports that Cognos did, and that was it. And when I, I saw the tool and knew it from my couple previous companies, I realized what an, what an advantage it was, and we started investing heavily in training and in uh, on-staff expertise, and we now have, uh, I think, in excess of 2,000 reports. Uh, we have professional BI developers that generate reports for users. We have users generating ad hoc reports all day long. Uh, so it was kind of an accident that we got a BI tool, uh, but it was a good accident. Yes, sir. How do you measure your success of your, uh, your investment in the big data sphere against the profit that you actually uh, generate for your company? You mentioned that IT uh, can be a center of focus with regard to uh, driving uh, the data and uh, helping to generate revenue through the data and its quality. But do you have in place something that monitors the, uh, the benefit that IT actually provides, or is it more anecdotal? Uh, no, it's, uh, we do a formal, uh, I'm sorry, the question was um, how, do we, how do we measure our success in using these BI tools uh, and how it relates to the business. Uh, we measure uh, with a, an ROI calculation all of our major systems. Uh, we understand um, how much our internal costs are for the IT team, for the servers that we lease, the software that we have annual maintenance on, and we compare that to the, what we consider to be the, the financial benefit of each of these tools. In our case, it's a little bit easy because we have these chargebacks and we have a very ready scorecard that tells us if we do things right and chargebacks are zero, we maximize our net income. If we do things wrong and we get hit with chargebacks, they are considered unanticipated chargebacks. And um, we, can, we, we pull those out into reports and we can calculate exactly how much we've cost ourselves by not managing our big data correctly. Any other questions? Well, thank you. <laughs>